Good morning. Today we're going to move into chapter 2. And in chapter 2 covers emissions. It gets into all the things that are involved with coming out your tailpipe or any emissions, anything that comes out of the engine. And due to the new emission standards that has taken place, it used to be we really didn't pay attention to emissions with a diesel engine. We didn't care about what came out the crankcase and really there was no monitoring what came out the tailpipe. But with the new tier four emission standards, emissions has become everything. And at first the reaction was, you know, it's, it's expensive, it's costly, it's a bad thing, but it really has dramatically changed the world of diesel engines and it has improved them dramatically. So lots of great improvements. There's a few things that are just frustrating and, and bad, but they will change over time. And so what emissions are we dealing with? So the emissions that we're dealing with are these four items here. Hydrocarbons, which is raw fuel. That's you spilled the gas, diesel fuel on the ground. That's your hydrocarbons. And we don't want to have leaks, any of those kind of things. Not the most, you know, yes, we're trying to deal with them, but they're not coming out the tailpipe. <clears throat> Second one is carbon monoxide. That's partially combusted fuel. Diesel engines do not create very much carbon monoxide. Most of what they deal with is carbon dioxide. But emissions, as far as emissions are concerned, these are the things that we're regulating at the federal government level. Oxides of nitrogen and particulate matter. This is the actual soot, the black stuff that's coming out. In a diesel engine, the bottom two are the most common items that we're going to be dealing with. <clears throat> and so we're going to be regulating those a lot. Carbon dioxide, until 19 or 2009, carbon dioxide was a byproduct of normal combustion and it was not a regulated emission. So we, we didn't pay attention to them. It was not considered toxic to plants or animals, so we didn't care. But today, they look at it and you've got lots of big cities that have lots of smog. And smog is that brown haze that you see over the big cities. It leads to global warming. And the smog that you see when you get into foreign countries, Japan, China, uh, places where they don't have that pretty lax control, there's a lot of fog, a lot of problems with health and just the air that they breathe. And that is a problem. Greenhouse gases lead to global warming. Warming is kind of what they believe. And because of the fact that diesels already start 30 to 40% less carbon dioxide than gasoline, we're already well on our way. So any improvements we make are already bet better than the, than the gasoline world. So it's kind of one of those things where, you know, it's another thing, why are diesels better than gas engines? So this is way back, 1970. This is like almost, you know, before you guys were even thoughts in somebody's minds. 1970, this is like ancient Greek history kind of thing. Air emissions inventory. So on and off road vehicles accounted for 87% of the emissions that we dealt with, 13% was other, and that would be factories or some power plant or something that was stationary. And so you can see it was a pretty significant amount of emissions that we were dealing with came from that. 2008, so we moved forward a couple of years, and you can see how this has changed. Now we're up to six, uh, 37% and the on and off went down to 63. And so as EPA has gone in and start regulating tailpipe emissions, emissions from factories and that kind of stuff, air pollution from mobile sources has gone dramatically down. This is 2008. If you were to get a chart from today, 2015, then that number would be even less. So we have ratcheted our emission standards up quite a bit since 2008. Combined average fuel economy standards. This is something that you're going to see and this is something that will make that chart change. So I wanted to make sure that we see this. 2011 the government wants the average, the combined average fuel economy. So I'm Ford manufacturing. They take all of their vehicles, take the 
um, miles per gallon of each vehicle, how many do they make, add them all together, divide by the number they make, what is their average miles per gallon. So they have to have some hybrids and stuff that get really good fuel economy to offset, pick up stuff that are actually low. And so in 2011, federal government says, EPA says 27.3 miles per gallon. This year for us, 31.6. So their overall sales of stuff has to go up. <clears throat> and you can see by 2020, that's four years from now, because it's actually 2016 here, in four more years, the average of their brand needs to be 35 miles to the gallon. So we're gonna be seeing improvements <coughs> in miles per gallon in most stuff. And with the standards for diesel and all the stuff that we do, there's been an increase in fuel mileage even in a lot of the diesel uh, world that we're out there. So diesel engines are the best solution for fuel mileage standards and reducing targets for carbon dioxide. So it's easier to take a diesel engine and improve these standards and these emissions than it is a gas engine. So source of emissions. Our emissions sources are gonna come from two sources, the exhaust and the crankcase. Those are the two areas that the, the EPA is regulating. In a diesel engine, there's not a lot of emissions coming from evaporative. So there's one more source that the EPA regulates, but not in a diesel engine, and that's evaporative. It's not up there, but evaporative is stuff venting through the, the tank itself. So plastic tanks actually breathe. Fuel line, you think of it as solid, it actually lets the lighter fuels out, and carburetors let it out. So we have all kinds of stuff on gasoline engines to deal with evaporative emissions. Diesel engines has almost no evaporative emissions, so that's eliminated from the world of diesels. So we just gotta deal with the exhaust system and the crankcase. Uh, what are the crankcase emissions? Because we don't typically think of that as an emissions. It's composed of cylinder blow-by gases and oil droplets that come from that ventilation. So as that engine's flipping around in there, splashing oil around, the piston's traveling up and down, it's pulling air in, pushing air out, pulling air in. And then the piston itself is not perfect. And there will always be some gases that blow by your piston. So leakage occurs mostly during the compression stroke. And most of the time when you read about <clears throat> crankcase blow-by, we always think of power stroke. In the power stroke, ignition of the fuel is pushing it down, that pressure is pushing past the ring and creates blow-by. And the reality is there's actually more gas leakage during the compression stroke than during the power stroke. And I think we'll see it here. And this is why during the compression stroke, it blows by more. So during the power stroke, the cylinder pressure is actually comes down. The way the ring is designed, it pushes the ring down, which seals the bottom, and it goes around the ring and pushes it out, sealing it against the cylinder wall. During a power stroke with all that pressure, especially under a heavy load, the heavier the load, the more that, that ring will actually seal against the cylinder wall and the less blow-by you have. At an idle, when the compression is low or the engine speed and everything is low, we'll see more blow-by during idle and we see more during the compression stroke. In the compression stroke, the piston is traveling up, it's building up pressure but it's not built up super high until it builds up pretty high and we really start pushing hard against the cylinder wall, you're going to see more gases leak by the rings into the cylinder. And so it's an area that we don't typically think of as a uh, place for blow-by. So most of the time, or mostly during the compression stroke. So emissions, these are all the different style of emissions or type of emissions that we're regulating on an engine, carbon dioxide, water, or these are all things that are regulated. These are things that actually come out of an engine. Carbon dioxide, water, excides of nitrogen, hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, 
and particulate matter. So an engine itself, we're going to be putting fuel in the engine. We put in air. Air is made up of only 22% oxygen. It's not a lot of oxygen and a tremendous amount of nitrogen. And then other is just other inert gases, depending on where you live and what you got. And then we have humidity, which is going to be your moisture. So we're going to have water going into this engine and it'll get burned up and discharged out again. So all engines are going to produce some kind of byproducts and they're going to take all of these and all of these, put them together, and what is the byproducts that are going to come out? Sources of a diesel engine emissions. We have crankcase that we talked about. We have a tailpipe, but we have virtually no evaporative emissions. We do not have an evaporative tank on the engine compartment to take fumes off the top of my fuel tank and convert them and put them back into the engine. So we don't have that because when you take diesel and pour it on the floor, it may sit on the floor for three days before it evaporates. It takes a long time. I pour gasoline, same volume on the floor, a couple of hours, it's gone. So gasoline, propane, all the other ones have evaporative emissions and that's important. In diesel we have virtually nothing. <clears throat> so this is blow-by, so they talk about it. If you don't know what blow-by, it used to be most car, most engines, had a crankcase breather tube and this tube would just hang down so it's discharged out in the air and so they call it a road draft tube or something and when the piston has leakage past the rings goes into the crankcase as this engine stirring up it's, it's you know moving stuff around <clears throat> and that excess pressure we don't we don't want it to build up if it built up in the engine it would blow the seals out so you don't want to be plugging off this tube that's over here. You want to make sure it has a place to go. So most older machines, this blow-by tube, this drow dab, just went out into the atmosphere. And so in a diesel engine, there's not a lot of emissions in here. The problem with the diesel is because there's all this oil splashing around in here, it's pretty violent. The oil gets mixed up in the air and with this air that's traveling out here, especially as your blow by starts to increase, droplets of those oil that's just mystified or vaporized, is floating around, ends up in that tube and discharges out with it. Now droplets of oil, maybe a little fuel mixed in with it, becomes an emission that we need to deal with. <clears throat> Most manufacturers take this tube, route it back into the intake manifold, and we draw it back in the engine and reburn it. That's the most common, you see that in most cars. Uh, if we draw that back in the engine and there's not a lot of oil in it, it's fine. We're going to reburn that gases and, and everything's good. If there's a lot of oil being sucked in with it, then you're going to start seeing your uh, intake manifold and stuff's going to have a lot of oil in it. So once you start getting a lot of blow by, that oil that's being carried with it can actually be burning and actually you're going to see it as a mission going out the tailpipe. The advantage of putting it into the air filter intake manifold is now I have positive crankcase ventilation because as the engine's drawing air in, it actually helps draw the gases out of the crankcase instead of just whatever pressures they're pushing out into the atmosphere. So I can actually have positive drawing on there and keep any pressure from building up. So that's the advantage of uh, positive crankcase ventilation. We looked at this already. <clears throat> so again, I want to point out, most of us just think of blow by coming during the power stroke. Think about it, it's really the compression stroke that a lot of these gases are actually leaked past. So it's just kind of something that mm, you may not have heard about before. So here's a crankcase breather tube on a 7.3 liter diesel, indirect injection. So this is just the tube that comes out and you just see these gases blow off and it just blows out. So it's one way of looking at how bad the engine is. What kind of condition is my engine is to take that tube off. You just disconnect it wherever it is and see how much movement you see. We're not going to get 
air blowing out of there just because we're agitating the crankcase. We're going to get it because it's going past the rings. That's really where it's going to come from. <clears throat> so if you pull that blow by tube, that crankcase ventilation tube off, and there is a lot of stuff blowing out of there, it's a pretty good indication of the condition of your engine. So if you have an engine that's not running very well, seems to have a lot of hours on it, that's kind of one of your troubleshooting things. Pull that tube off and just see what it looks like. <clears throat> this is a Cummins engine. So in a Cummins engine, in order to prevent some of that oil from actually getting out into the atmosphere or drawing it back into my engine or reburning it, <clears throat> they have this crankcase filter up on top. So on top they have a mechanism and it's just to help as it's traveling through this coarse medium, it's the oil sticks to the medium and then drains back down into the crankcase. So they're just separating out the oil droplets and then because there's no oil in it then, <clears throat> they just run theirs down onto the ground and let it go on the ground. So I don't know how old this system is there since 2007. Well, since 2007 has been regulating it, so I don't know. Today, with the new tier four emissions, we probably can't even discharge that out on the ground. They might still have to recirculate it. But by getting rid of all the oil, now I'm not drawing oil into my engine. That would be a good thing. I just watched the video of Kendall today about the new 2017 Cummins engine and they're actually making a tour out of it and sometime in the September area, August, September, July, they're going to be here in our area with their tour. Wow. So changes pretty fast. I mean, you can see, and we're going to be dealing with a lot of old machines. Just expect that's what this tube is for. Make sure it's not kinked. A lot of times this hose is a, a thin hose. <clears throat> It'll get a crack in it, then it starts leaking oil all over the place. Or it gets kinked over and gets hard, and it kind of blocks off. It's partially blocked. And then I start building up gases in my engine. We don't want gases to build up in the engines for two reasons. One, pressure blows seals. Two, but not get rid of those gases, there are some acids that will build up. So you get a lot of acid and, and oil degradation by having the, the gases stay within the engine. So we want to draw those gases out as much as possible to, to keep them from contaminating my oil. <clears throat> Hydrocarbon, so where does hydrocarbons come from? They're formed from unburned fuel. Inadequate combustion time could be one of the major reasons or ways that they're not burned. It could be improperly mixed air and fuel. So we'll, we'll be looking at, you know, the old style mechanical injectors. Are the injectors atomizing correctly? Are we coming out of all the holes? Is the opening pressure the right pressure? Does it drip or leak? So we're gonna be looking at those things on the old system. The new system with the high, common rail system with high pressure it's going to be impossible for us to test you would actually do other diagnostics if you suspect them you would buy injectors and put them in and you can't rebuild the new new uh, high pressure ones so of course spray droplets would be from bad injectors of some sort insufficient combustion heat and pressure if it's cold out you get out in the morning and it's cold there's going to be cold temperatures which we're we're firing by heat of compression if it's cold we lose too much heat it doesn't burn very well and so in chapter one we talked about lag time and the things that affect when that fire takes place when it begins and what it takes to actually get it done before bottom dead center again and the exhaust stroke this is falling in that category low compression <clears throat> carbon buildup anything that's not helping us have a nice clean hot burning engine. Another thing that they looked at, did a lot of research on, and with the invention of computers and little cameras that they could put in an engine, they were looking at crevice, crevice volume. And you don't really typically think of it, we're looking at a piston, and we're looking at, you know, the flame is coming in here, we inject the fuel in here, it's swirling, we got a flame. But that flame has to go all over, and this crevice volume, this, this particular piston has a really big distance between the ring 
and the top of the piston. And there's a gap in there. There should be space. You can see the space in the video or picture up there. There's a lot of space in this picture and that fuel that's in there is going to end up in this cavity. And when that fuel burns in that cavity, what is it going to do? If I'm between the piston and the cylinder wall and I ignite and I expand, I'm pushing it sideways, really. And there's not a lot of space for it to kind of expand and actually do us some good. And there's a lot of times where the flame, and we've got these flames that are up here, but we don't have flames down here. This is going to be a, a late burner. I mean, this is going to be where the flame finally reaches and starts burning, but that piston is going to be way down before that happens. And so they discover we have a lot of unburned hydrocarbons because they get caught down here in this crevice volume and they just don't get burned very well. You know, they get burned late. Carbon it's going to cause the carbon buildup that we seen the other day when we were looking at those pistons. All that carbon we seen down here, that's going to be carbon buildup because low pressure, low heat, poor burning, you're going to see that problem. So there's an area that we don't typically think of as a problem. So what they did is they changed the crevice volume. We moved that ring up higher. There's only, you can only move the ring so high before the ring land gets so weak that the ring would actually break off the land. So we can only go so close, but there was a lot of room. You can see where this ring is and see where this ring is. By rising or raising this ring up higher, we could reduce the crevice volume and that reduced emissions. So it's one of the things that they've done to improve fuel mileage and emissions that are taken out the tailpipe. This particular example is from a Volkswagen. So, so that's another one. So there's a lot of places where we see emissions that kind of build up and we've been in, able to improve them. Carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is a colorless, odorless, tasteless gas that can kill you pretty quick. So it's poisonous and concentrations as little as 0.1%. So it doesn't take much to be in the air before you can get hurt. Diesel engines produce very small amounts of carbon monoxide in compared to gas engines. So I don't know if I've asked you guys this, how many people have ever heard of someone committing suicide by starting their diesel pickup in their garage and trying to kill himself? Come on, why don't why don't they do that? Well, they do, I mean diesel engines produce it, so it's possible to kill myself if I go in a garage and start a diesel pickup or a car, some kind of diesel vehicle. I love my John Deere tractor. Put my John Deere tractor in the garage, start it up, <sighs> breathe in <clears throat> until you die. Takes longer. So first of all, it's going to take a long time. So you probably have a lot of afterthoughts before it happens. So there's one reason. What would be another reason why people may not kill themselves with suicide with a diesel engine? Because it doesn't have as much carbon in the diesel exhaust that does gas. So it would take longer. But what else might lead a person to think what well, might be a logical reason why people don't do it? Because I've never seen it, I've never read it, I've never heard of anybody killing himself with suicide by like starting a diesel vehicle in a garage and waiting until they die, purposely. It could be loud, so it might be just not a very pleasant, uh, happy death like that, I guess. I mean, I guess people like to be happy when they die. The other thing is diesels put a lot of particulate matter, the other one that we haven't talked about yet. And so, what does the particulate matter do? It irritates your eyes and you start coughing. So like, I, man, I can't take it anymore. <laughs> my eyes are burning and my nose is up, I'm sneezing. And, and they probably just get so irritated by it that they decide just to get out of the room before they actually overcome by carbon monoxide. So that's my theory is that the particulate matter is too irritating for such an unpleasant death. So I don't know. Carbon monoxide is not the way to try to commit suicide is by diesel because it's just not there. It takes a lot longer because they don't produce much. Just saying. So, <laughs> diesel engines do not operate near the stoichiometric air fuel ratios, so they don't. They have an excess amount of oxygen all the time, so it's harder to produce carbon monoxide because of the excess oxygen. 
low combustion temperatures and pressures, lack of oxygen, insufficient burn time, all increase carbon monoxide. So these are the things that actually lead to carbon monoxide in a diesel engine we usually have high combustion temperatures because we're heat of compression, high compression ratios, we have a lot of heat, that eliminates it. A lot of pressure, our combustion pressure, typically, you know, three to 600 PSI. So that's a reason we don't see it. Lack of oxygen in diesels, we have excess amount of oxygen. And some insufficient burn time, most diesel engines don't turn as fast as a gas engine, so we have more time to actually burn the fuel and uh, get rid of the stuff. So diesels are have all these other benefits that decrease our carbon monoxide. So we're looking at some a chart here. We have different kinds of fuel. We have biofuel, number two diesel, which is our summer fuel, and gasoline. What is the temperature that it will auto ignite? and you can see that there's a big difference between them so they change flashpoint at what temperature will it just evaporate and disappear so gasoline minus 50 degrees it'll vaporize you go out there in alaska and it's bitter cold pour some fuel it'll evaporate diesel probably be there for a long time if you were out there below zero degrees so it doesn't evaporate very well at all Oh, unless you have number one diesel fuel. So, weed vapor pressure, that's how much pressure, it's its ability to turn into a vapor and actually pressurize. You can see with a biodiesel, 0.2, and number two diesel, it's 0 0.04, and in gasoline, the pressure is pretty high. And so, uh, down here, I have a video that we want to watch, and this video has a lot of interesting things in it. And so we're gonna watch this it's related to reed vapor pressure and then some of the things that we need to deal with in an emissions situation. So we're gonna watch that. We're gonna stop the film, watch this video, and then we'll come back and kind of discuss it a little bit.